fly. I jump around a lot. Um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think the scriptures are a textbook. You know what I mean? Like I don't think it's like all right. So this chapter, and then you follow. I just believe that the Lord is. He speaks to to us, and He's also spoken in His Word. And sometimes He makes points throughout all of Scripture. So if you don't have it right in front of you, sometimes you're just listening, but you're not necessarily interacting. So um, it's that's a big deal. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get my timer up here, so I don't lost you guys. Um, I'm looking forward to this message because. Um, this is really what I would consider the vision of who we are as a church. Um, you know, we started the church for a reason, not just, you know, because we wanted, you know, it wasn't like a career move. Um, it was because we, we believe that the Lord is calling us um, to something. And so today I want to talk to you guys about what is the vision of the Fellowship Church. I talked about this a while ago. But I actually want to take the next couple of months and really kind of extrapolate um, it. So here's how I would, I would encourage you to listen. If 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 you go here, if, this, if you consider the fellowship your church, if you consider the fellowship your church, take this time to see what you agree with, what you may not agree with, or just as you're you're talking about talking to people about the church, why why do you think it's important for them to come? You know, I, I'm a big believer in you don't need to go here. Um, there's there's hundreds of churches in this area, and a lot of them are good. So what makes our church different? So if you go here, it's important that you would know what are the things that make us different, and, and why do you feel like people need to come here? If you don't go here, I would I would challenge you because not that I think that our child say I don't think our church is the only right church. But I'm pulling from scripture the, the, the points that I'm going to make. And I would challenge everyone to search the scriptures for yourself to see if wherever you're going or wherever you want to go is aligning itself with scripture because it's important. We're not, you shouldn't be going to church without, to a specific church, without a reason. I'm a big believer. I went to a church a long time ago, and, they, and not too long ago, but... Um, they would say, if you can't grow here, don't go here. <laughs> I believe that, big time. So, open up your Bibles to Acts 2, 42 through 47. This would be the scripture that we stand on as the Fellowship Church. This is what, we, this is what we're trying to emulate here. When you get there, give me an amen. Amen. Louis is always there quick, fast, and in a hurry. All right. So when, when someone else is there, Acts 2, 42 through 47, give me an amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to read it, and we'll pray, and then we're going to dig in. Acts 2, 42 through 47. So then, those who had received, I'm sorry, I'm starting at 41. Um, those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls false. A lot of you guys know this. This is the first sermon of the church. The spirit falls on the disciples. They begin speaking in tongues, not just the 12, but 120 of them. They begin speaking in tongues. People come around to see what's all of this stuff going on. Peter stands up and he preaches the gospel. And in that moment, we see in verse 41, 3,000 people get saved. Boom. The church has begun. So 42, this is, this is the snapshot we give them. Now it describes the group. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders were taking place with the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
Father, I pray that you would bless your word. Um, I pray that as um, I teach, I pray that you would, you would speak through me. Um, you would speak to the hearts of everyone listening. Um, I pray against any pride, um, any confusion um, in, in, in me, God. I pray that you would clear all of that out, God, that you would fill me afresh with your spirit. And I pray that you would fill, fill the church with your spirit to receive your word. Um, I pray for clarity. I, 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 I come against distractions in Jesus' mighty name. Um, Father, your word says that if people don't hear, it's because they're blinded by the enemy. And we cancel every work of the enemy in this place right now. Um, and I pray that people will receive your word with gladness and with understanding in Jesus' mighty name. So in Acts 42, Acts 2.42, it highlights four things that the early church was doing. So it highlights four actions in 42. It says, teaching fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Those are the four things that I'm going to break down over this next month or so about the fellowship church. How does it look like in our church? But today I'm going to focus on teaching. But I want you to pay attention to something. And, and you guys have heard me say this. I, this is kind of going to be repeating for some of y'all. But um, it says, it doesn't just say it's something that they did. In 42, it says they were continually devoting themselves. It's important that we understand the language because the word used for devoting is a Greek word, word proskatera. What it means is, the definition is this, to continue to do something with intense effort despite difficulty. For me, that is the first amazement is that their effort towards doing these things was intense despite the difficulty. So the point that I'm making, and, and this may seem like elementary to you, but it's important that we know. The early church wasn't doing these things just because it was fun. They weren't doing these things just because they didn't have anything else to do. The early church was doing these things out of a, a, a desire to be devoted to the Lord. And it says it was an, an intense devotion. One of the things I love about it, it says, despite difficulty. It was a lot harder to go to church and be a believer in those days than it, are, than it is now. As a fellowship, you guys know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be legalistic, none of that stuff, but we have to ask ourselves in everything that we do, we have to count the cost. We have to ask ourselves, okay, should I go to prayer? Should I go to church? And ask yourself this. Am I extending intense effort despite difficulty? No condemnation on anyone. Listen, if, if I want y'all to hear me say that, and then when Wednesday prayer comes up, that you be condemned. I'm not saying that at all. I, what I'm saying is, let's not be a church that only does things when it's easy to do. Most of us, when we think about the early church, if you listen to, to sermons, if you just listen to people talk, People idolize the, the early church and they talk about we need to get back to how the, the early church was doing. But do we have their intense effort? I want that to be the attitude amongst the believers here. That we're not taken out of the game when things get tough. So, the other thing that you get here in Acts 2.42-47 through is you not only get what they, what they did, but you also get the results that they got. And it's broken up here. So in verse 43, we see that it says, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. Now, skip down to 47. I believe 44, 45, and 46, they explain some of the actions. I'll get to that in the next few weeks. But the other results are down to 47. Praising God, having favor with all people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So you get four results there. The feeling of the sense of awe, the signs and wonders taking place, favor with men, and then you also get the Lord adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. I'll get into all of those later, but I do want to make one point about one result, and you guys know this is my favorite result, and it's in 43 where it says feeling a sense of awe. You guys should know this. Does anybody know the Greek word that's used there for all? Phobos. Phobos. Yes. 
Tell us what Phobos means. It's an amazement with, with fear. So Phobos, the actual definition is, it's two definitions. It's fear and terror or reverence and respect. Give you an idea. It's a Greek word. So in the New Testament, when we see this word, phobos, one of the first times you see it is when Jesus is walking on water. It says the disciples looked and saw him walking on water, and they were filled with phobos. It says when, 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 when the winds and waves were coming and Jesus came out and he says, chill out, waves. I don't know, that's a fair break. It says the disciples saw this power and they were filled with phobos. Phobos is a perfect word because it is a mixture of amazement but fear. Now when you think fear, don't think of just terror. Think fear as in reverence. See, here's a great example. If God was to show up right now, a lot of us would say, that's awesome. God is here. But there's also the reality that the Holy One who created the world, who knows what you were thinking last night, who knows what you did a couple weeks ago, who knows everything, is also here. There's a mix of reverence but fear. As a parent, I promise you this. If you have parents, well, when you become parents, you want your child to know that you love them, but they should have some fear of you. Because if they don't, they will be ridiculously disrespectful. Is that, am I telling the truth? Yes, that that's true. right. All right. <laughs> I don't fear her. So, so, we think, so we, when we think of fear, we think of fear as, as, completely, as completely a bad thing. But it's not. It, it, what it really is, it gets you to stand up straight and realize this is not a game. When, when Moses approached the burning bush, God said from the bush, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. So it says that in Acts, the, the early church, they were feeling this same <coughs> sense. Another place, you guys remember when, um, when the guys cut the hole in the roof and they, and they lowered down a, a, the, the paralyzed man? It says that when, when Jesus healed the man, everyone in the room was filled with bubbles. It says, here's, here's what it exactly says in Luke 5, 26. It says, they were struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with phobos, fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. This is why this is important. There's a difference between awe and phobos. I don't like, I, I, I think awe is a bad translation, but who am I? See, awe creates action and movement, and excitement. But often when people are awed and when they're amazed, once the dust settles, there's no life change. Anybody ever gone to a message that you thought was just groundbreaking and you were super excited about the message, you felt like it spoke directly to you, but then a week later, nothing in your life has changed? You were, you were in awe. Phobos creates impact. Because Phobos introduces you to the creator of the universe. And that's what causes life change. See, Phobos is not about signs and wonders or a person or a teaching. Phobos connects you to the creator. So, I'm going to tell you about teaching. And then my hope is to, to show you how this type of teaching will create these things in us as a church. So, first, let's talk about the apostles' teaching. If you're taking notes, take this note. The Fellowship Church is devoted to teaching that exalts Christ and has the intention to see him form in us. If you had to ask, if someone says, hey, what are they teaching at the church? This is what you can tell them, that we are devoted to teaching that exalts Christ and has the intention to see him form in us. So first, let's deal with teaching in and of itself. Teaching is foundational to the fellowship. Not just our church, but the fellowship, the church, universal. 
See, if you are a believer, you have to have a high view of teaching because we're defined as disciples. A disciple means learner or student. A student is a one who, a person who is learning. A disciple who is not learning is not a disciple, just by definition. See, a disciple is one who is being taught. We're not described as people who are motivated, or people who are encouraged, or people who are excited, or even people who are wrecked. We're described as learners, disciples. Now, sure, you can learn from a variety of means and, and, and experiences too. I'm not saying it comes just from someone preaching. However, the Bible is specific to say that they were not devoted to learning. They were devoted to teaching. Another way to say it is they were devoted to being taught. Even the leaders had a high value for it. Go to Acts 6, 2 and 4. While you're getting there, I'm going to tell you the background. So, the a bunch of people get saved, and they start wilding out because you have Jews, you have Gentiles, and then you have people who are just from completely different sects where they just did not like each other. To the point where they got together to feed people, and people were purposefully not feeding the widows of other types of people. This is what we call racism in the early church. To the point of like, you're not, we're not even going to feed your widows. So in Acts 6, 2 through 4, this is the response of the early church leaders. It says the 12, which was the leaders at the time, they called a meeting for all the believers. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Let me ask you this. If you had a conversation with your pastor and your pastor said, hey, listen, I'm not serving food. I need to devote myself to teaching. From what you know of the current church culture, is that a good conversation to have? Now, nowadays, I promise you, the pastor who is in the kitchen cooking, people are going to say, oh, man, fantastic. Look at him. He's such a servant leader. He's sacrificing. And, and there's a place for that. You guys know, like, I'm not, I'm not saying not to do those things. But here, you see that the apostles have the audacity to say, this is actually not a good use of my time. Because it was a calling. This does not mean that as a leader, I should never lend my hand to do anything. This does not mean that as a leader, or even for you guys who are looking at, at possibly being in ministry, this does not mean that you, you are only supposed to teach and not help. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, look at their priority. Their priority, they, they, they dealt with their teaching as it was important. That's all I'm saying. Second, the apostles' teaching. This is the type of teaching. See, it's important to be clear. They were not devoted to just any teaching. It doesn't say that they were devoted to wise teaching or entertaining teaching. It doesn't even say that they were devoted to the great teaching of the apostles. It says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, Paul, we can't get it twisted. It's not about the apostles. It's not, it's not saying that these people were superhuman, so they loved listening to their teaching. Even when you read in the scriptures, the apostles actually rebuked people when they tried to make them higher than they were. It wasn't the apostles, it was what they were teaching. Because what they were teaching was different. Understand at that time, majority of the believers were Jewish, which means they were already had some type of religious devotion. They were already going to the temple, they were getting weekly teachings from the synagogues, out of the scriptures, by the way, so they were getting good, solid teaching already. But the word teaching that's used here is actually a Greek word that means doctrine. It's talking about their specific teaching. They were devoted not to the apostles, but to their doctrine, what they were teaching. So what do you guys think was different about what the apostles were teaching? Anybody got an idea? Jesus. 
Jesus. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 real quick. Sorry, I know I jumped. But now you have it in front of you. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Now here's, here's where I want you guys to hone in. Because honestly, this is one of the reasons why we felt the need to start the church. This, this here is a big freaking deal. If I can make that very, very clear. What I'm about to get into, this is extremely important. All right, we there? When I came, this is Paul the Apostle talking. He says, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in precise, persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. See, the apostles weren't looking for a way to present Jesus more powerfully. They believed that the message of Jesus carried its own power. <coughs> Bless you. Amen. <laughs> We see here, if you say in 1 Corinthians, in verse 2, Paul says that he made the conscious, the conscious effort to focus primarily on Jesus. Despite his weakness and fear in verse 3. If you read in verse 1, he says, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming the testimony of God. He said, I'm already coming to proclaim the testimony of God, but I did not choose to use special speech or special wisdom. See, Paul not only trusted in Jesus for his life, but he trusted in the power of his message. Amen. This is why this is so important. Because this is almost the opposite of what we see in the North American church. In verse 4, Paul says that he didn't use persuasive words of wisdom to get his point across. Yet, these days, most, most preaching relies exactly on that. I've preached long enough to know focus on Jesus isn't always what gets people going. You know, one time I preached at this school. It was a school where a lot of people have come, had come from broken families. A lot of people had trauma. And I was preaching for a conference they had. And I preached in the morning and I preached at night. My morning message was about bitterness. And I talked about how trauma created bitterness and how, I just talked about bitterness, right? There was not much Jesus in that talk. And the reason why I did that was because I had a second talk. My second talk was all Jesus. Now the first talk, I, I have never, to this day, have never seen people respond to a message like that. People were screaming crying. And this is like young, black, hard kids. And I mean, dudes, do rags was falling off. Games afterwards. They canceled the games. All oh, you should have seen the fear in the counselor's faces because they had never seen this. And, and they canceled all their events and they just stayed in the sanctuary for a couple of hours counseling kids through all of this stuff that had come out. Yet, I just talked about bitterness. The second message, I talked about Christ, where freedom from that bondage comes. And people looked at me with no response. There was no response to prayer. Nothing. The first message was practical. And, and practicality is important to some extent. But understand, I can't practically get you out of bondage. Jesus can, though. Amen. I have a responsibility to get you to Jesus. But here's the problem. Most, most cultures nowadays, they're moving away from God, but the truth of the matter is, a lot of people still know the message of Christ. I used to do a basketball ministry. Nobody there was believers, but if you ask them, how, how do you go to heaven? They will all tell you, except Jesus, my Lord and Savior. So the temptation is for me to give you something extra that would give you some, something powerful so that you can come to Jesus. But yet here, Paul is saying, no, 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 no. 
Jesus is the power. Amen. We hear a lot of persuasion, a lot of wise words, a lot of energy, a lot of motivation, a lot of really dope quotable phrases, but not a lot of Christ. But see, when you teach in the way that God ordains you to teach, exalting Christ, God ordains it, and he blesses this type of teaching because not only does it exalt Christ, but it begins to form Christ in his disciples who are under that teaching. Listen, I don't want to like defend anybody, but the amount of times I have talked to people who go to events here and, and I go to this meeting and it's always these dope meetings. But when we talk to people, there's no maturity. How? How are people under an immense amount of teaching that is blowing their minds and you're still under bondage? I can't dope line you out of pornography. It's just not going to work. You, you really think, has anybody had sex before? What kind of word can I give you to stop making you have sex? Are you kidding me? You know what does that though? Jesus. Amen. Anybody ever been in love? You fall in love with somebody, right? And, and, and if, if they go to this church, where do you start going? Right? Because that's what love does. Message that it, messages that exalt Christ, it makes you fall in love with him. Amen. Next message. The next point. <laughs> it's teaching that has the intention to equip. You can just listen. You don't have to go here. But if, in Ephesians 4, I'll get to this at some point. Ephesians 4, I believe, is, is such a layout for how God wants the church to go. But in there... It says that when Jesus left, he actually left and gave gifts to the church. And it says that he gave gifts for the sake of equipping us. I'll read it. So in verse 11, it says, he gave some as apostles. How many of you guys know, I, just, just, I don't want to get into it, but just say everyone agreed in apostles, that apostles are still working now, right? How many of you guys know if an apostle came in, you would you would probably and you believe he was an apostle, you'd say, wow, some amazing stuff is about to happen. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets. And if I ever receive a prophetic word, blows your socks off, right? Some as evangelists. Anybody ever seen somebody preach the gospel to hundreds of people and they get saved? Then it says, and some as pastors and teachers. They don't seem to carry the same weight. But then in verse 12, he says, he gave them for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. We will attain all unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man. Then it says, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Teaching is one of the things that God has ordained to equip you to get to the stature of Christ. This is how he's planning to do it. See, the apostles were teaching that righteousness could come from faith in Jesus. We all know that. The majority of the American church knows that. But it wasn't just that. It was the teaching of the lordship of Jesus in the believer's life which results in a fullness in your own life. So it's not just preach Jesus a lot. It's about the intention of, I want to see Christ formed in you. See, being a disciple means that we're becoming more and more like Jesus, which means experiencing his fullness, which means depression, lust, anger, shame, they can all be rooted from your life. It means that the things that have broken us, like mental abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, betrayal, their power can be broken and those wounds can be healed. But here's the thing. Nothing in God's word says that it's just supposed to happen automatically. We just read in Ephesians 4 that God has actually given teachers to help equip you in this work. See, here's the thing. I'm not just talking about shallow teaching. I'm talking about solid teaching too. Because here's the truth of the matter. If, if you go to someone's church and that person preaches the Bible, and their intention is that you would understand the Bible better, it falls short. Let me say that again. If you go to a church 
and the preacher, the teacher, that church's whole purpose is for you to understand the Bible correctly. And that is the end of their intention. They fall short. You know why? Because you can understand the book of Romans, but never understand the freedom of it. And as a teacher, if my intention is that Christ be formed in you, I got to preach that thing differently. In, go to Colossians. I told you. Colossians 1, verse 28. Everybody, and somebody except for Louis, give me an amen when you're there. Amen. But I want them. <laughs> Colossians what? Colossians uh, 1, 28. 28. Look, if you, if you think that I'm just like, I'm really excited about this. I want you to read what, what the Apostle Paul says. Talking about Jesus, the Apostle Paul says in verse 28, we proclaim him, admonishing, which is warning, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may what? <coughs> Present every man complete in Christ. That was his purpose. It wasn't about, like, how do you obey this Bible better? No, no, no. How do I see you complete in Christ? He says in 29, for this purpose, I labor. Let me, listen, one of the reasons that we, that we felt so convicted about starting a church is, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to bash anybody, I just got to tell you my own heart. Because the amount of leaders that I have seen, that's not their purpose. That's not, like, you understand that in some places, the bulk of people's work is meetings. Listen, I'm a husband and a father. God has, God has called me. This, this, this could be a season. This could be at, oh, this church could be a wrap at any moment. He's called me to my wife and my son for the rest of my life. Before I started the ch this church, I don't play with that. If I'm talking to a leader and that's not your intention, I'm out of there. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to become the best Baptist. I'm not trying to become the best charismatic. I'm not trying to become the best reformed guy. I'm trying to become like Christ. Period. And if from your teaching, I'm not getting that intention, I don't want my wife sitting under it. I don't want my son sitting under it. I'm not going to sit under it. My challenge to you Wherever you go, if, if that leader, if their intention is not to see Christ formed in you, find somewhere else to go. Don't need to be here. Don't think this is a plug for me. This is just my heart because I have seen so many people so excited about Jesus until things change in their life. It was just motivation. It was just a vibe. Come on, man. If, 10 people, if you hang out with 10 friends and nine of them get saved, you don't think you're going to end up in a church? You think that's enough to get you saved? Do you think that's going to get you free? No. Christ needs to be formed in you. You care less how the worship sounds? I don't know. I don't care if y'all like if y'all like the spot that we're in or not. I don't care if we have a dope venue or if we don't. Is Christ being formed in you? Is that my intention? When it's not, get me out of here. Because understand, that's your only hope. Otherwise, you're going to live a life there's a, a elsewhere in scripture it says, one man lives his life built on the foundation of Christ. The other man lives his life built on the foundation of the things of the world. And he says, when the second coming comes, everything that's not built on Christ is burnt up. And the man who's a believer, but he built his life on the other things, he'll get into heaven. But the Bible says, as though burned through fire. It says he, he'll get in, but he'll get in smoking. How, how? How, this is why it gets me so frustrated. Because I know believers that have been under the same bondages for years. It doesn't even make sense. How are we telling people about peace and we're stressed out all the time? And you know you're not supposed to be stressed, but all you do is you get messages that talk about don't be stressed, don't be stressed, don't be stressed. Give you a dope metaphor, but Christ is not being formed in you. See, it's, it's not just mentioning Jesus in every sermon. This is, this is the point. It's not just mentioning Jesus every sermon or doing some altar call at the end of a message. 
A message that is simply motivation with some Jesus sprinkled in there is even worse because it gets people excited enough to stay, but they never experience freedom because they don't know how. Great example. My son came to me the other day. He, uh, we had to get him because he's he's crying. Uh, we get a message from another parent saying Elijah's out here crying. So we went to go see what happens. Long story short, he was walking with two friends, and um, he said something to a, a friend said something, and he said something back, and the other friend kneed him in his leg, and he's crying. But like my son's a tough kid, so I was like, why are you crying? Well, what happened was he was he was hurt because he thought that it was his friend. And he felt so rejected. This is the difference. I did not tell him, well, son, if God be for you, who can be against you? Is that biblically correct? Yeah. Yes. Here's what I told him. Son, I opened up the scriptures and I said, son, look at Jesus. It says that he was rejected too. And then in Hebrews it says that he went through things so he could identify with you. What a great God that he went through those things so he knows how you're feeling right now. And then his rejection actually allowed you to be accepted by the Father. Man, oh my God. Come on, man. Because you know what it did? Now, instead of saying, well, God before me, who could be against me? You know what he said? This happened to Jesus. I'm a <laughs> disciple. Then I showed him the scriptures. Now, he's not tripping off the next time it happens because Jesus said, if it happened to me, it'll happen to you. But fear not, you have overcome the world. Amen. Christ is formed in him. Amen. And it's not just so, because I have to equip myself because life goes on past that moment. Amen. A lot of Sundays are just therapeutic. Come in and, oh man, that was a good word that you pray. I come from a black church, so if I go to pray, praise it out. <laughs> and it's therapeutic. Yo, he, he, here's how you know we're off base. Because if you look at the teaching in most North American churches, it's just a recycling. Why are you still giving messages about haters? Why do you still have haters or why are you still upset about it? Why are you still giving messages about overcoming the, the Goliaths in your life? We haven't figured that out yet. It's 2019 and we're talking about adoption. We ju we're just now getting that. But the scriptures have been there forever. We talked, Mike and I were talking about union with Christ a while ago. It's like it's in, it's in the scriptures. But people don't talk about it because there's other things that you can give five points to a healthy relationship. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If there's no teaching that exalts Christ and that equips the body to become more like him, at best, we'll produce converts who believe in Jesus, but who are still under the same bondage and still in the same sins as the world. At best, they'll be motivated, they'll be encouraged, they'll be wrecked, they won't be free. This is why Paul says in Galatians 4.19, listen to the heart. This, this is a leader's heart. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Are you kidding me? It's everywhere. I've been in enough leadership meetings to know that this is not the talk. Sorry. This gets me so frustrated because, listen, you guys know that biblically I'm responsible for you guys. If you come under this teaching, I'm, I'm held to a responsibility. And guess what? According to scripture, on judgment day, the Lord is going to ask me, how did you try to develop Christ in them? He's not going to say, hey, did they, you know, did they overcome the giants in their life? <laughs> so he's just not going to do that. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> results. So this, this type of teaching should, should yield us some results. Write this down. Right, put results in the dash. The fellowship church is, expects to see God move in us and through us. There is an expectation in our church that the stuff we talk about, we will see happening inside of us. That's right, Philippians. 
Austin's just trying to flex. He wants y'all all to know he reads his Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to give you three results based on what, what we read earlier in uh, verses 43. So you guys remember Phobos. Let's get back to Phobos. Phobos. So this type of continuous teaching that exalts Christ, it will form Phobos in us. It will form that, that fear, that all that reverence in us. Here's how. Because continuous teaching that exalts Christ, it keeps us close to the cross. It keeps us reminded, reminded, listen to my words, not living in it, not still under it, reminded of what it costs for us to be saved. Amen. I was in at the Bible study. We we're talking about people going under under the law, like people who, who have been saved and now they want to go back to like legalism, like, oh, I have to worship on this day. And, and Lupita said something, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, it's, it's like Jesus died for you not to have to be under that. It's like a slap in his face for you to be saved. Because Jesus was murdered and tortured on your behalf, and now say, well, yeah, but you can only worship on Saturdays. That's, that is active phobos. He's constantly aware of God's... See, when, when you're reminded of the cross, you're constantly aware of God's holiness and your need for a Savior, but yet at the same time, because we have a Savior, we are... We are Fully aware that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Him. Amen. Constantly teaching on Christ, it leaves no room for people to not be clear on what a believer is and what it is. This is a big deal. Listen, I feel like I'm kind of in both. I can be both. I can be really, really like reformed sometimes, and I can be really charismatic sometimes. Here's here's my my my, my thing with. Well, let me get my thing about reform first. A lot of reform, like more conservative teaching, they're so they're so solid on the Bible that their their number one question is, can you repeat back what I just taught you? Not do you know it, but on the charismatic side, it can be so experience driven. I've had conversations with people in those camps, and they cannot communicate to you the gospel. What saves a man? They. The number amount of teachings that I've had, I've been in charismatic churches where it's like, oh, we have to do this reminder message because don't get it twisted. It's all about Jesus. There should be no need for that message. That should be a, a consistent theme in your fellowship. Listen, especially for us, I, I promise you guys, we're going to see some signs and wonders in this church. We've seen it already. Amen. Amen. Don't get it twisted, though. It's not just God doing signs and wonders. I hope you guys know that. I spent enough time in the New Age stuff. I know we were talking before somebody got in here. If you've ever been under certain in certain belief belief systems, you can feel you feel a presence there too. And sometimes people come for that. Sometimes people come for the vibe, but it doesn't mean that they come for Christ. But if your fellowship is constantly exalting Christ, it makes it easy for people to understand where we really sit. Amen. Signs and wonders. This type of teaching, we'll see signs and wonders. Real simple. This is my second and last point. We'll see signs and wonders really simple. Because we should. I don't even think that that's, that's not even like this profound statement. The Bible is very clear on this. It's what they saw when we read verse 43. We see later on in Acts 4.30, you don't have to go there. But as they're praying, one of the things that they pray for is what? Signs and wonders. Be, be aware of people who say you shouldn't seek signs and wonders. Go to Acts 4.30. They saw it. Amen. And just so you know, so we don't idolize the apostles, in Acts chapter 7, you see that the, the, these signs and wonders moved from the apostles and they began to be done by the church. Everyone should believe. Everyone get yeah, people who believe, not just the leaders. Even to this day, we've seen people pray to heal people and heal. We've seen people heal. We've seen visions. We've seen all types of stuff. See, we should expect to see these signs and wonders 
not to be superheroes, not to puff ourselves up with pride. We will see signs because God is with us and he himself is a sign and a wonder. Amen. He's where the power comes from. In verse 43, listen to this. It says, signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. Even when they prayed for signs and wonders in chapter 4, they, this is part of their prayer. They say to, to God, they're saying, you, you, talking to God, you extend your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders. It's his power, which means that he can come through anyone he chooses. You, 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 because you may I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> now, why should we expect signs and wonders? God does these signs and wonders not to impress men, not as some magic trick, but as a testimony to the truth being presented. See, when I, I use the example of, remember the people, they cut the hole in the, in the, in the roof and they lowered down a crippled man? <laughs> Here's what's crazy about that. This scene, Jesus is up there teaching. Imagine, just out of nowhere, this guy just gets laid down, right? They hear that Jesus can do all these signs and wonders. Jesus walks up to the guy and he's like, everybody holding their breath. <laughs> Jesus is like, your sins are forgiven. And he walks away. <laughs> <laughs> But here's the thing. The Pharisees were watching. And in the back, the Pharisees are like, who does this guy think he is? That he can just heal sin. Or that he can forgive sin. Then Jesus turns over to them. He looks at them. He says, which is greater? That this man be healed or that I, I forgive his sin? But then he says, but so that you know the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, then he heals the guy. Boom. <laughs> now, be clear. We're not Jesus, but we proclaim him. And there's power in his name. So the same power that raised Jesus is working in us, and we should expect for that power to spill over in our lives. Amen. This is best shown. This is, this is the biggest reason that we'll, we'll see signs and wonders. Mark 16, 20. You don't have to go there. Just listen. Mark 16, 20 says, talking about the disciples. This is after Jesus leaves. This goes out. The disciples go out and says, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by signs that followed. If we are preaching and exalting Christ, the entire Godhead gets excited. Here's how I know. God the Father sends his son, even speaks through the heavens and says, this is my son, listen to him. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points at Jesus. When you do the same thing, it only pleases the Lord. And we will see that the Lord will work with us and confirm our word by silence. Lastly, the last result we should see is we should see God add to our numbers. Real simple. Why? Jesus said, if I would be lifted up, I will draw all men. See, God will add to our number because we are faithful to him and his message, but also because people practically want to be free. Like, that's just reality. Isn't it cool? Like, I mean, you, you said his knee was hurting one day, he just went and prayed, and his knee, his knee was healed. For example, Louis was oppressed. He was oppressed by a spirit of happiness one day. We prayed, and it gone like that. <laughs> like sometimes people want that. You guys know that, right? Amen. Like we pray for uh, Chris and the thing we're praying for him. He said, oh, "I feel light." People are drawn to that, so we should see people. We should see God add to our numbers. Jesus said that His sheep hear His voice. When we proclaim Him, we're putting His voice out there Amen. for a sheep to hear Amen. and to be drawn. So um, here's what I want to do. I want to pray. challenge and encouragement to you guys. Um, find this teaching. Wherever it's at. 
because it, I mean it, it's it's very important. Like don't don't come to to church to just be a better you. Come to be like him. Be shaped in him to have victory over sin, freedom from bondage, joy, peace. You know it's funny. Jesus said, he said, he said when he leaves, he says, "I leave you with my peace," but it's his. You gotta know him. He has to be formed in you to have it. Oh Lord, um, thank you so much. I thank you so much that you've given us your word to confirm the the, the, the spiritual words that you give us. Um, God, I pray that this would be a conviction for all of us, God. That fun that we would we would continually devote ourselves to teaching. Amen. That we would view it as as not a burden, not an add-on to our Christian life, but an actual means of grace for us, Lord. And I pray that as we continually devote ourselves to teaching, God, that, that you would exalt Christ more and more in our own lives, Lord. So God, um, now Father, I pray that you would just impart some of this stuff to us, God. Um, we know that we hear with our ears, but we also have a spirit. So, Father, I pray that you would take this time um, and help to push these truths down deep. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. 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 Yeah, Chris, even when you're talking, it was really speaking to me in the sense of, um, I think a lot of times we do, just I've noticed even in myself, um, to be transparent, I've gone through seasons of, you know, waiting for the next good message or the next good worship service or the next prophetic word or the next good Christian book to speak to me. And the reality is it's all about Jesus, you know? And um, even now, I'm, I'm going to go through a song, but I really could care less if you guys listen to the words or if you guys sing along. I think um, just spending this time focusing individually between each one of us and him, letting him minister to us, the Holy Spirit speak to you. And I'd encourage you to spend most of this time not giving but receiving, meaning um, not necessarily praying, not that you can't pray, but um, let him speak to you. As Chris said, um, we're his sheep and we hear his voice, and that's a, that's a promise from him. So each one of us has the capacity, the ability to hear from God, even if it's a simple, I love you, I care about you. It doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, that he's going to give us, you know, our, the next 10 years of our life right now. But just encourage you as we just go through this song, just to, just to, um, just to listen and just to soak in his presence and, um, yeah, just focus on him, receive from him.
know, sometimes we can um, we can have a heart for for us to to walk in in, in Christ and walk in this union, but you know, sometimes it's really hard just to to see this the life in Jesus and you know make us a, a statement, make a, a step to it when we have a lot of the easiest things to do, just living our lives and, you know, feel comfortable, quote unquote. Uh, but we're not happy. We don't have that peace that God talks about. And, uh, and we're, like, divided in those two sections of life where we see what God has called us to, to do and then our life, you know. And I love what Chris says, that we're not here to, to come to be better us, but it's to become more like Christ. And, um, if you're someone who, 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 who sees Jesus and sees the life of Jesus in the walk of life, and you want that, and you want to be more on fire for the Lord, and you want to walk into, into these things that we see, you know, and ask people walking into, but it's just, for some reason, it's just hard. Um, I just want to read Zechariah 4 and 6. It says, for, uh, Zechariah 4, verse 6, it is not by my not by power, but by my spirit. Yeah. It's not our, our our own energy. It's not our own uh, wisdom. It's Him. And it's just actually just yielding that for the Lord to come and, and be ruler of that. So I just want to pray uh, something. I think maybe if you guys can pray with me as I say and repeat. Um, if you're that person right now, you want to be more on fire for the Lord, if you you want to go into this life, um, please repeat it. If not, also just pray with us. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, I forgive everyone. I forgive everyone. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me. Wash me and cleanse me. I believe you died and you're coming back again for me. I believe you died and you're coming back again for me. Thank you that you have chosen me. Thank you that you have chosen me. And that you have a purpose for my life. And that you have a purpose for my life. I thank you that in the name of Jesus. I thank you that in the name of Jesus. I can ask you anything according to your will. I can ask you anything according to your will. And it will be done. And it will be done. Therefore. Therefore. I ask that you give me great courage to preach your word everywhere I go. I ask that you give me great courage to preach your word everywhere I go. Stretch out your hand with healing power. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miracle signs and wonders be done through me. May miracle signs and wonders be done through me. For your glory. For your glory. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will say whatever you want me to say. I will say whatever you want me to say. I will do whatever you want me to do. I will do whatever you want me to do. Father, Father. not my will but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. And your mercy. And your mercy. To you belong all the glory. To you belong all the glory. And all the honor. And all the honor. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So yeah, thank you, Father, because you are so graceful to us, Lord, and you, your hand is upon us, Lord, and, and your spirit is here with two or more gathering in your name. You said that you're here, Father. And we know that is true, Lord, and, you, and we see, we feel it in your message, we feel it in your presence, Lord, and we just want to be more like you, Jesus. And that's why we all labor, Father, or be more like you, Father. So I just pray that you would hear our voice and our cry from our heart, Lord, because you know our hearts, you know where we are, Lord. You know what we need and where we're reaching for, Lord. So we just pray, Father, that your will be done, Father, in our lives. And that your hand be upon us at all times. Cover us with your holy blood, Jesus. And the message, Father, and the seed that was planted today, Father, be protected in our hearts. For no birds of the sky could take it, Lord. The enemy cannot go and block and do something to take it away from us, Lord. We rebuke any spirit that wants to mess with that, Lord. And we honor you, glorify you, give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus. Amen. 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 The message, Father, today, Father, be protected in our hearts. For no birds of the sky could take it, Lord. The enemy cannot go and block and do something to take it away from us, Lord. 
rebuke any spirit that wants to mess with that, Lord. And we honor you, glorify you, give you all the glory, Lord Jesus.